We'll be printing Hello World from the Occam computer language, which runs on a transputer. Uh, we won't be going quite as far back as the Sarah McLaughlin quote, and across from a faith that died before Jesus came, but transputers were a chip that died before YouTube came. So they're kind of dead and gone. The transputers were around from the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s, and then they stopped. Um, you can still buy them. Uh, if you want to go out on eBay, eBay, you can get a transputer chip, but even better, you can uh, put a transputer core in an FPGA, and so you could make a million brand new ones if you wanted to. You might even be able to put several transputers in a uh, FPGA core as the size of FPGAs gets better and better. Transputers are kind of unusual in that they're designed around a process or procedure, if you will, that communicate with message passing. So they don't have a memory-based uh, uh, message passing idea. You don't put things in memory and pull them out again. You send um, basically byte messages uh, from one process to the other. Now, a process uh, can reside, the processes can reside on the same processor. You could have 100 processes running on one processor, or you could have 1,024 processes running on 1,024 processors. So this is a showing a uh, transputer T9000 hooked up in an array where um, you have four links on each transputer, so you can do up, down, left, right very easily. So this, again, is a little different. It's not like in a computer where everything is memory-oriented, where you can read to memory, write to memory, and create arrays in memory, and they're just all there. Uh, so this is like one process sends a message to another process, sends another message back, and on and on. Okay, this is the inside of a uh, transputer. Um, the central processing unit, virtual channel processor. Again, channels are very, very important. So not only can you have hardware channels, but they can make them so that you can share one hardware channel with a whole bunch of virtual channels. So this is all done in hardware to make life very, very easy for people. Uh, there's a schedule. This crossbar is not what we usually call a crossbar, but it just shows you that these were real hardware freaks who designed this stuff, that you have this uh, four banks of cash, and they can be addressed by the CPU or the... Uh, virtual channel processor or the schedule or the PMI all at the same time. So the transputer people threw a whole ton of hardware at every problem. They made it work. Um, again, like when you output a message or input a message, uh, it'll sit there and wait for the message to come. There's no uh, operating system. There's no schedule or there's no interrupt. Just by saying input a message, the hardware will actually sit there and wait for the message to come in, then automatically handle it. So this uh, CPU is a uh, microcoded um, CPU, so it's kind of like a bit slice. I've designed those before. So you have micro instructions. As a matter of fact, I think you can even change micro instructions if you want to, but we won't be getting into anything like that. So anyway, so transputers are like, say, I think we're designed by hardware freaks. I'm a hardware guy, not a software guy. Um, you can look at my um, video for uh, practical digital logic design if you want to see what I did. Uh, I actually wrote that in HTML back in the days before uh, YouTube. Um, so uh, let's go on to the next picture. Now, again, because links are so important and messages are so important, they actually have this thing called a, a four-way um, crossbar which can actually take one link and go to any of the other three links, or this link can go to any of the other three links. So it's a dynamically programmable crossbar. As a matter of fact, this is only a four-way crossbar, but they also make a 32-way crossbar um, so that you could actually hardwire every, every one of 32 uh, transputers to every other one of 32 transputers dynamically if you really wanted to. So it's a very, very powerful architecture. Again, it's because you have a lot of little processes out there and they're running. You don't really care where they're running because they know how to talk to each other. Uh, again, they threw a whole ton of hard work at this so things happen at a very, very low level without having an operating system, without having to have interrupt handlers, without having to have all this other stuff that everybody else in the whole world needs. 
Okay, here we have the Try It Out TIO page. And uh, as promised, you can just click on Hello World and it'll bring up the Hello World program. So let's take a look at the uh, Occam software, uh, which is what we're going to do. So we start out with an or include course.module, which is some mysterious include file. Uh, I have no idea what's in it, but there's useful stuff there. And let's look at some Occam. Uh, PROC is procedure named hello, and it defines a channel of type byte, which is output. Now, Occam is really oriented around multiple procedures that communicate with each other by messages. So they send messages between each other. Um, there is no like global memory really, um, because you could have an array of 1,024 Occam processors with one process on each one. And uh, they could actually just communicate by, uh, again, messages. You know, there's really one bit each way, one bit out, one bit in between two processes. But they'll nicely package them up as bytes for you, which is characters, which is what everybody wants. And then we have a function called out.string, hello world, as promised. The dot here is just like uh, a delimiter, kind of like underscore. Um, it's nothing to do with object-oriented programming. It has nothing to do with a field assignment. Um, so it's already output here. It, it actually ran when I started up. So let's just see, change it a little to see if it's really running again. So we're going to add some characters in our output string. And sure enough, it output. So this is a complete functioning running Occam program. So let's go on to our next program. Okay, uh, again, we're going to try and look at the uh, features of Occam in a little closer. Dash dash is a comment. So this is an Occam comment. Uh, we're using the try it out emulator. Here's the base page for it. Here's the page specifically for Occam Pi. Um, again, the computer is called a transputer. The software is called Occam. And there's even a microcode for Occam, but we won't get into that. Here are some online reference books you can use if you want to look up all this stuff. Uh, there's a busy spinner at the top of the page for it to stop. So when you run it, you click on here to start and then it'll spin around until it's done. So this program will input a character um, and then output a character. Now to input a character, you actually have to use this input field So I'm going to type an H into our input field. And then here's our output field. Uh, so let's see what happens when we run this. We click on start, spins around, it's done. And we output an H, ah, and there's a 72. So let's look at the program a little more. Procedure hello4 has a channel of type byte. And it has an input and an output. We're going to define a, a variable of type byte A. So we have some sequential instructions. We input get A. So that gets it from the keyboard or our input. Then we output um, the value of A. Uh, so again, uh, you, could, you could call it out bang A, and that's going to the out bang port. And just so these things don't land on top of each other, we have an out string of carriage return, or we're going to get a new line. And then we're going to use a function called out.byte to see what the numeric value was. So we input an H, we output an H, and then we output the H as a numeric value, which is what out.byte did. So that's that program. Okay, going on to our next uh, Occam program. We're going to use the for loop, which is kind of uh, useful when you're initializing arrays. It's not quite as powerful as most programming languages because it only does a for loop on one instruction, as far as I can tell. So we have a procedure called sample.output, and it uses a channel of type byte that only outputs. So we'll define a byte. We'll define an integer n. We'll have some sequential instructions. Again, only Occam needs to tell you that they're sequential instructions. X is going to get the letter H. 
we're going to set n equal to 5. So we'll use a function output string and it'll send output bang to the, uh, key, to the screen. Then we'll output the value of x, which again was capital H. Then we'll output a string space. And then here we'll use the for command i equals 1 for n, n equals 5. We'll output the character x. So we should get five h's in a row. Um, then we'll output a space just to, so we can see them. And then we'll use another for command, but instead of giving it a variable, we'll just tell it, hey, just do it three times. And now we'll output x again, so we get three more h's. So let's go ahead, see what happens when we run this. So we got output h, five h's, three h's. So we output x, we did five of them. Well, it was a capital H, then we uh, output three of them. So that's it, one h, five h's, three h's. Okay, now we really come to the heart of Occam, which is, remember, the, the idea is you have separate processes that could be on the same computer or on different computers, and they all talk to each other by message passing through a port or a channel. So here we're going to have two processes, and they're going to output an input uh, between, between both of them, so there's two-way communications between each process. Now, I really wanted to be able to use the process command for each process, but I just couldn't get it to run. There's this place in, uh, parallel command you use, but this really is two processes. It just, in this case, is running on one processor, which we're, is what we're emulating anyway. So we're going to type H in the input field, and then we're going to bump it up one, and then we're going to output it uh, from the other. Well, we're going to output it. So we have process communications, channel by in one uh, input and channel byte out one, which is an output. Now this is something new. We're gonna have a channel between the processes called channel byte comms one and comms two. So this is how the, the processes are gonna talk to each other. This is how we talk to what you could consider the, out, the outside world, the, the, the input field and the output field. So we're gonna say parallel, which is a unique Occam thing. It says these processes run in parallel, and uh, parallel actually runs at the hardware instruction level. There's no operating system, there's no interrupt handler, there's no nothing. You, you run a parallel instruction and the hardware does all this stuff because it's smart enough to do that. So you can see that you know even though Occam is very low level, it does some pretty amazing stuff. So we start out by uh, defining it by X. We have some sequential instructions. So N1 gets X, so we're going to get that um, from our input field. Then now, comms1 is going to output X, and comms1 is connected to the second process, where we come down here, comms1 gets X. So we output X from the first process, we get X from the second process. Then again, we're executing sequential instructions. Comms2 is going to input from the other process, and here we bumped X up by one and we output it. So it went from here to here to here to here. So we went back and forth between the two processes and we'll see what happens. So there's our H and let's run this puppy. And we got an I because remember we bumped it up by one. Well, let's say you think this is a rig demo. So we're gonna do J, run it again, and we get K. So again, this is the, the essence of Occam is we have two processes that are talking to each other by message passing. So here's our last example. Um, uh, this is a function. Um, so what we're gonna do is multi have a function that multiplies two numbers and returns an answer. So we're going to define a function, not a process, of type integer, it returns an integer. We're going to call it multiply.2, and you pass it two ints. 
Now, int is dependent on processor word size. So in this case, it's a 32-bit number. You could have a 16-bit int or even a 64-bit int, but the processor this is emulating is the 32-bit. So we're going to define an int of type answer, and then we're going to have value of, which is just how functions kind of work. We're going to have sequential instructions, even though there's only one. Answer gets R times S. Remember I said we pass it two numbers and then we're going to output those numbers. And then we say the result of the value of is answer. And that's it. That's our function. So let's see how we use this. We have a process called main body with a channel of type out. Well, the other thing about process is you have this uh, end process, which is this colon. Very, very easy to forget it. So I, I always put a comment out there, end of process, just so uh, you remember that, yeah, you need that. It's so easy to forget to copy that colon and then the whole pro program hangs. So process main body with a channel of type byte called out. So we're going to have three integers, x, y, z, some sequential instructions, x equals five, y equals seven. And so then we're going to have z gets multiply dot two, and then we're going to pass it x and y. And here we're going to output the value of z. Now, five times seven is what? So when we run this program, we should get 35. So again, what if you think, oh, well, I cheated and just put that out. So let me change that. And then there we get 495, which is hopefully the correct answer. So there's uh, all of our programs uh, as promised. Uh, we did uh, give you hello world and a little bit more. Hope you enjoyed it.